If this works, I think you're gonna like it. Ha, take a look at that. Oh, that's awesome. Hello and welcome back. Okay, this is one of the videos where I record the intro after I've recorded and edited everything else. So I know what you've just seen and I'm really pleased with it. So I know this is a really long video, so let's not wait around. Let's just jump straight into the, the build process of that uh, circuit. Okay, so this is the circuit we had at the end of video two, and we had some pretty good results from that. Let's have a quick reminder of how it works. We've got the sync generator down here, and that's predominantly using this EEPROM with appropriate data encoded in it, and these counter chips which are indexing into there to generate the horizontal vertical sync and then a series of additional signals such as the blanking and a reset to bring the counters back to zero. And then this part of the circuit is the output side. And what that's doing is taking a byte of data from the CPU and outputting that into the color lines. We've modified the clock down here to take the derived clock from the CPU, but uh, we're not gonna need that anymore. Let's go back to driving that from the crystal and we need to use the divider to divide by 16. So we can kind of think of this latch chip as a one byte frame buffer. Whatever it contains is going to be output for the entire visible section of the signal. And what we really need to do is introduce some additional memory so this becomes more of a standalone circuit. Right, now I'm going to disconnect this because this chip is going to be driven from somewhere other than an IO load operation. That's where the main bus needs to go, but we're not going to connect that up right now. Pull that line high, just so this isn't outputting to anything. We can pull this temporarily. So now whatever we trigger as a load into here will be output. Let's, um, let's plug that in and give a, a little reminder of it. Now, Rather than a physical monitor, I've got these two devices, which are a VGA to HDMI adapter and one of these cheap little HDMI capture devices that plugs into USB. Now I do like to check what I'm doing with a proper VGA monitor, but this I think is gonna give me um, a much simpler way of, uh, of, of keeping track without uh, filling up the desk with monitors. Need some power. Going to need a signal. That's the load. Okay, so we seem to have a solid yellow screen now. So that's all the blue bits. I'm going to add all the red bits. That's that nice program on magenta. Let's turn off the blue bits and add the green bits. So that should be yellow. That's cool. I think what I'm inclined to do is make that load every clock. Okay, so we need to move towards getting some RAM in here that is being read out um, an output to this latch instead of uh, doing it all manually. Let's get another bit of breadboard. Now the address we use to access the RAM is interesting because eventually we want unique pixel data going out to all 640 by 480 pixels. Now we could try and put rows sequentially one after another, but that makes a few things a little bit more difficult in future. So I think we kind of need to round that up to powers of two so we can subdivide the address. So 640, the next available power of two is 1024 and 480, the next available power of two is 512. So that's 10 bits and five bits respectively. But our counter chips, they're four bits a piece. So rounding that up, that's uh, both going to require three counter chips. So uh, let's start off by getting some counter chips in and see if we can work out how to make them count to the X and Y coordinates that the display is currently outputting. I'm going to use these 74LS163s again. All of them will need power and ground. 
OK, there's two count enable lines on these chips. But I think I'm just going to bring the bottom one high on all of them. All right, then the load line on all of them, we'll just bring that high for now. Then what is now the main count enable line on the lowest order chip in both of these counting groups. Let's make that active. But then for these subsequent ones, we want to take that count enable from the carry output from the one before. Still getting used to the signals on the 163 because I'm a lot more used to the 193 counters. OK, now we've got the clear lines, which I think we want to tie them all together in the two groups, and the clock lines, which will be the same. OK, it's cool. I think initially I'm just going to bring these down to ground. Then this clock, is it going to be the X coordinate? Now that needs to increment for the full pixel rate. So I kind of wish I had some more of these um, capacitor sockets. OK, so here we've got three bits for red, three bits for green, two bits for blue. So I'm going to use this little bit of breadboard to tap me into those. So I'm going to connect all the greens and the blues to ground. It doesn't seem smart to leave them floating. And I'm going to put the red lines into this middle counter. Let's see what that looks like. OK, so we've got this odd alias pattern. If I bring that low, this is the clear line, then we don't get anything. If I let it go high, we're there. OK, so what we want to do is just reset that on a per line basis. So there we go. I'm using the horizontal sync to reset that counter, and suddenly we're actually getting some stable bands. I could move these lines across we can see it at a much higher frequency. That's nice and stable, actually. In fact, that's the first time we've actually changed the signal out for every pixel. Now, what I want to do with this next step is hook up memory such that we can drive every 8x8 pixel group. So that's uh, going to give us 80x60 blocky pixels. So let's change the indexing to do that. The least significant bit will be there which is the most significant bit in this right-hand counter. And it's the next two there. OK, that's cool. Now, we're misaligned slightly with the start because the sync happens a chunk before the start of the line. But that's, uh, that's generally pretty good. In fact, I think we can do the same and use the vertical sync as the reset for the vertical count. Vertical clock needs to be once per scan line. OK, so to generate that vertical clock, I'm going to add it to the ROM. Let's use the next bit from the top. I actually think the inverted horizontal sync would do it. But let's make it one 16 pixel group wide. We're going to take the clock from that extra line we've just created, which is there. So this should be counting scan lines now. Oh, that's awesome. OK, this is very close to what we want, but the counters don't start at zero in the top left. They're slightly offset because we're using the sync signals to reset them. Now, there's a couple of ways we could do that. We could use some additional lines on this chip for reset signals that actually coincide with the start of the line. Or instead of reset, we could use the load and offset the, the starting value on these just by modifying the values that get um, parallel loaded in. It doesn't really matter either way. And 
I don't think we actually need to do that now. Um, I might look at it later. But what we've actually got here is we've got the addresses that we want to use for our look up into a RAM chip and that's working really nicely. We've proved we can actually uh, change the pixels at uh, a nice high frequency. So let's think about RAM. Okay, so what we could do is take seven bits from here, six bits from here, wire them into the address lines of an eight kilobyte RAM chip and uh, the contents of the RAM would be displayed on the screen. Awesome. Unfortunately, we've got no means to actually change the contents of that RAM. That's where things are going to get a little bit more difficult. So uh, let's have a talk about how we can do that. Okay, to start with, we should probably just define what the problem is. We have two separate hardware devices, the CPU and the VGA adapter, and they both want to access the video memory. VGA wants to read from it, the CPU needs to write, but it will probably want to read from it as well. The problem here, of course, is the RAM normally has one set of address lines, one set of data lines, and one set of control lines, so we can only really wire it to one thing at a time. So what we've got here is fundamentally a contention issue, which we need to work out some way of resolving. There's a lots of different approaches we can use to deal with this, so let's have a look at some of them. Okay, the first and in many ways most obvious solution to the problem is to use dual port RAM. I pictured this one because it was the most available one when I went searching, but there are different types. And these are actually very, very good for solving this kind of problem. They literally have two sets of address lines, two sets of control lines, and two sets of data lines. And you can separately access the contained memory independently from those two channels. This option is by far and above the simplest conceptual way we can look at handling this. The hardware is after all basically designed to solve exactly this problem. It does fulfill one of the primary requirements of the VGA circuit, but it has no impact on the CPU design or execution speed. Against this solution, they're expensive. The RAM chip we looked at there is a little over 20 pounds per, per part for eight kilobytes. And you know that's a lot more than we're otherwise paying for RAM. In some ways, I regard this as cheating within the confines of my goals for this CPU and VGA combination. I'm trying to explore the kind of low level techniques for putting all of this together. And the dual port memory is kind of a higher level device. Really and truly internally, it's a piece of single port memory with a whole bunch of mediation logic and buffering to implement the dual interface ports. It would be better for this project to actually look at uh, taking a simpler memory architecture and doing some of that uh, buffering and interfacing work ourselves. And besides, it's really expensive. Looking at what my goals are for the memory subsystem for VGA, we're going to kind of double the component cost of the entire build. And I don't think that's the right choice. So the next technique I'd like to talk about is time division multiplexing. So here we have single port video memory, but we mediate access to it over time. So that the memory subsystem would be run at twice the clock rate. Half the time, the VGA would have access to read from memory, and the other half of the time, the CPU would have access to that memory. So we would need the extra circuitry to switch the control lines from the CPU to the VGA, but by doing so, we would have a a logically simple way of having two separate ports into that video RAM. Now in favor of time division multiplexing is it's very much an 8-bit era technique. Conceptually it's very simple. We get a lot of the functionality of dual port memory and all we're actually having to do is add that um, higher frequency switching from one to the other. And it's very easy to understand what's going on there. Now against this technique is we need twice the RAM speed. And in order to implement the full 640 pixels across, we're already having to run at a pixel clock rate of 25.175 megahertz. So that's actually going to be pretty quick in order to implement this at, at double the clock rate. 
We've also got to maintain synchronization between the CPU and VGA clock rate. There are techniques you can use to get around this, but really you want the CPU to be running at the same clock or an exact divisor of the VGA clock. I think this would be too fast to run on a breadboard. 25.175 megahertz is already a little bit tricky on a breadboard to double that and I think we're asking too much with the wiring compromises we have to make. So the third technique I'd like to look at is bus request. So what we do is we wire the RAM directly into the CPU as we normally would. But just like with the time division multiplexing, we take into account a timeline. So that timeline is going to take advantage of the fact that the VGA is only actually outputting color data for a portion of the frame. During the blanking interval, it doesn't need to read from video memory, and so the CPU can have unimpeded access. During the visible sections of the frame, we activate the bus request line, which prevents the CPU from accessing the data bus and the address bus, and lets the VGA subsystem access video memory without impairment. So this means the two systems cooperate, but during the visible section of the frame, the CPU is held in a non-executing state. Now again, one of the things I like about this technique is it is an 8-bit era system. It's pretty much the simplest circuit you can envisage for solving this problem because you get around the contention issue by simply not running the CPU when the VGA needs to access the memory. And that makes it the least costly solution. Now against this technique, first and foremost, it's a massive CPU performance hit. The visible region of the VGA frame is the majority of time, and so the CPU is only going to be executing for a fraction of the available time, and that's uh, that really not very satisfactory. That makes the technique just not right for this particular project with my goals. So this was actually the technique Ben Eater used interfacing his VGA circuit to a 6502. Now he has very different goals for his project and he's going for circuit simplicity and ease of explaining it and I think this was very much the right decision for him. One technique I did consider was separating memory into different chunks that the CPU and VGA can independently access as long as they're not trying to access the same chunk, but then you only actually freeze the CPU if it attempts to access the same section of memory as the VGA. But I discarded this idea because it would require a bunch of extra circuitry in the processor to support that kind of mediation. And there wasn't really a good place to build that circuitry. I wouldn't have a good explanation for doing it on the CPU side and on the VGA side a lot of extra custom work on the CPU to implement it just didn't feel like the right thing for the VGA project. So then I looked at a hybrid solution, taking a few different ideas from some of the other techniques and seeing what we can put together as our own circuit design. So what I wanted to do was go part of the way down the road of designing a dual port memory system. And the simple way I looked at for doing that was to double up the memory. So very simply, the VGA can read from one piece of memory, the CPU reads from the other, but then memory writes have to happen to both of them. So at the cost of adding an extra memory chip, we've halved our problem because it's only writes we need to mediate between the two bits of memory. So what I plan on doing is having the same timeline consideration as we looked at for the bus request system, but I'm going to attempt to mediate it in software and not actually solve the contention issue. I'm going to give the CPU priority in the memory writing, but if we get the processor to monitor the blanking interval and only actually write during the blanking interval, then we can make this work with a lot less circuitry. If the CPU were to write while the VGA was in the visible section of the frame, we'd suffer some corruption because the CPU would take over the data bus and whatever it was writing would become the value for that current pixel. But we have quite a pr powerful processor, so we can worry about doing some timing ourselves, but we can make some educated choices on how to manage that. So this method fits the project. Throughout the build, 
I've attempted to build reliable circuitry, but where we can do some things in software, such as solving contention in the pipeline, we do so. The circuit is still quite modest. It's not a lot different from the bus request type circuit. It's not a lot different from either the bus request or the time division multiplexing circuit. All in all, it's a pretty good balance, I think. Now, the biggest flaw is we're doubling the amount of memory we have. We need software timing consideration in order to avoid possible corruption. I do kind of like the fact that we can make that choice for ourselves, though. So if I want to update the whole screen really quickly, I can just blat that into video memory. In a game, you might do that at the start of a level. But then when we're actually playing the game, we uh, include the blanking information into our update loop and uh, avoid the possible corruption. So this is what I'm going to build for the VJ circuit as it currently stands. Before I go on though, I would like to talk about a possible extension to this system. And instead of attempting to broadcast a write between both sections of memory, we write to the shadow memory section, but instead of overwriting the VJ's access to the second copy, we actually put that into a write FIFO, which we flush into the video memory during the blanking interval. And this takes the hybrid design all the way to essentially a dual port memory solution that supports read and write from one side and read from the other. So I think this is quite an elegant extension to the system, which is entirely optional. I'm not planning to actually do this as part of the main VGA build, but if there was interest in it, I might look at it as a, as a little breadboard on the side project later on, because it is just an additional piece of circuitry. Let me know what you think in the comments. Okay, so we're not gonna need these red, green, and blue lines for now. Let's get a bit of extra breadboard in there. Okay, so we need some RAM and I've got these 7164S chips. Now these are 64 kilobit and eight kilobyte RAM chips. They're fast enough to access a byte for every cycle from our 25 megahertz clock. The pinout on these is very similar to other memory chips we have. Let's have a quick look at that. So you see here the, the data lines and the address lines we do have are in exactly the same place as the 32 kilobyte ROM chips we're using or the 32 kilobyte RAM chips we're using. The big difference is the two locations here where we'd expect the two additional address lines to bring the addressable memory up to 32 kilobytes. There is a not connected and a second chip select line. This one looks non-inverted. So actually you could do some interesting expansion of the address space without needing any extra chips using that. Now, when I explained my planned workings, I did suggest I needed a second memory chip. But if you think about it, we don't need that because we've currently got RAM covering the entire 64 kilobyte address space. So if we map this in as the VGA circuit side memory chip, then the existing RAM will form the other half. Now to do the selection of the main address lines, We've got to be able to take them from the X and Y screen positions coming from these counters, but we also need to be able to take it from the address bus. So I'm going to use these 74LS157 2 to 1 multiplexers. Power and ground. Now pin 1 on these 157s is the select. Now we could obviously go either way, but I think what I'll do is I'll have the high input be the VGA subsystem accessing the memory and then we can treat the selection of this circuit for the CPU to access as an active low signal. I'm going to tie all of those select lines together so connecting these is going to be tricky. That'll do it. For now I'm going to pull the select lines high because I want to get this circuit running with just the VGA accessing it. I've got a fault that all the other SRAM chips I've dealt with initialize with random data in. If this holds true to that, we should be able to get some random data on the screen from the contents of this chip before we have to get the, the last part of this circuit working. Okay, so the strobe input, let's pull that low. 
OK, so the data outlines are split. There's five of them there and three of them there. And we're going to want to be able to take the data out onto this ribbon cable. So I'm going to take the three data lines from here and bring them up here just to make that easy. It's worth commenting actually that I've got these data lines in order now, but I didn't have to. If they were reverse order or shuffled, it wouldn't matter at all because I'm using the same data lines for a write as for a read. So if I'd swap two bits in the write circuit and the same two bits in the read circuit, I'd get the same data out. Same applies to the address lines. I've got um, on the data sheet a set of uh, numbering for the data lines but I can actually just remap them arbitrarily. We only actually have to worry about the exact ordering on the EEPROMs where another piece of hardware is going to use the addresses. Okay, for now, right enable will pull high. I believe this chip select is active high, so we'll pull that, pull that up. This chip select is active low, and I think we always want to be low on that line because we're gonna have the chip either selected because we've detected a right to it, or we're going to have it selected because we're reading from it for the main VJ circuit. And output enable will pull that low as well, although that's obviously going to have to become dynamic later on, same as the write enable line. Now we've got all the address lines on the RAM chip, which we need to take from the outputs of the multiplexers. Now we're currently using these in order but we don't need to actually have a fixed mapping between what we regard as the addresses and the actual position here, as long as the inputs from the counters and the inputs from the address lines agree with one another. And I think it would be very convenient if we have the bulk of the lines from this side coming to these two chips and from this side to these two chips. Okay, so that's the first eight address lines. That's actually quite straightforward. One more address line on this side. Let's take that up to there. Now the Y coordinate is going to need six address lines, so we need one more on this side. The X coordinate is going to need seven address lines. Then we've got three demultiplexers left. Okay, so the lower three bits of the X position we want to ignore, so then the first actual bit is there. So that's X done. Exactly the same pattern here. Okay, so I think that's all of the address lines where we want them. Seven for the X, six for the Y. Okay, let's take a look at that. Okay, I'm seeing pretty random pixels there, which is good. There seems to be alternate lines, alternate groups of four pixels are white, which is going to be 255, probably. So I don't know whether or not that's suggesting a bug, but I don't think so. I think that may just be a artifact of the initialization data in this RAM chip. Yep, looks like it. Okay, that's great. We've actually got a RAM chip implemented and working as a frame buffer now. We've got a lot of the circuitry down here that we need to interface this back to the CPU, but we've got a bunch of control lines here we've hardwired, and we need to look at those now. But let's get another breadboard in. And you know this circuitry up the top, um, so I'm just going to let this push off the top because otherwise it's going to get more difficult to see what's going on here. Okay, now firstly, the data coming from these address lines, we want to be able to set that data from the mem data bus. So we need to conditionally put mem data into here. Okay, let's transfer power and ground down before I forget it and then suddenly get confused when nothing works. Okay, so I've brought these eight data lines down. Now I'm going to use a 541 line driver chip to conditionally output those. So it's power and ground. And then we've got the two output enable lines. Now this one will bring permanently low, 
but then what we want is the output enable line on here to be the inverse of the output enable line on the RAM chip. So we never want these two devices to be contending the driving of these uh, eight data lines. Now we could put an inverter from one to the other, but then we've got this potential contention because of the slight delay. And we've looked at different ways of doing this before. We could use a 138 chip to drive the two output enable lines, or we've previously looked at using exclusive OR chips in order to uh, have the same number of gates between the inverted output and the non-inverted output. But I think we've got some spare lines on these 157 chips that we could use to do that. So I'm not suggesting this is the correct way of doing it for the circuit. I'm saying this is a way we can utilize some spare gates that would otherwise uh, be going to waste. So when the select line is high, we want the output enable on the RAM chip to be low. So we forced it low at the moment. So I'm going to take the output enable line from the output of this currently unused multiplexer channel. So then we can say when it's high, we want this line to be low. That's when the VGA has the read access to the circuit. And when our select is low, we'll bring the line high. I think that's pretty elegant. Then we'll use the spare one over here to do the same on the line driver, only with the selection the opposite way around. Okay, so when select is high, we want that one to be high. When it's low, we select the output here. So that's good. So whatever's on these lines, which will be the memory data bus, if we change the select line, we'll get the data from there into the inputs of the RAM chip. Okay, I'm going to swap this for a slightly shorter cable. So I'm going to need the long ones later. Let's give this a quick test. So I'm just going to set the bottom three bits, which are the red bits. And then when we change the select line, that's everything we get out. That's cool. Let's add the blue bits. Yeah, that's all working as we'd hoped. So we need this line to be a memory write selection for the appropriate address range. And we've got the write enable line that we're currently not doing anything with and we need to drive that properly. I think we can use exactly the same trick. Let's power that. So we take write enable from the output of this multiplexer. When selection is high, we want that to be high just as it was before. And then we're going to need that to actually be the right line with appropriate timing. Okay, what else do we need? I think we're going to need to actually plug this into the main build soon and start giving it uh, some of the final wiring steps. But we still need the address lines to go to the other inputs on our multiplexer chips. So we're kind of masters of our own destiny here. I'm going to say those lines are our address lines. Now remember, when we actually wire these into the address lines is when we're truly defining the order of them. So we've matched the first four lines of the counters. I've been worried about this and figured I was going to get here and uh, discover these lines don't reach, and they don't. Fortunately, I've got six longer yellow lines. Right, so we've got the three top bits of the address that we haven't needed so far, because what we need to do is conditionally perform the selection based on those three lines in order to position this RAM chip into our address space where we want it. I think at this point, it's going to be worth us getting the main build out in order to start thinking about how we're going to do that. All right, let's get this back in. Let's see if we can get this wired in. Okay, we need memory data wired into here. Don't actually have a spare connection point for memory data. Made a little adapter that gives me some extra terminals for it. Okay, this is our right enable line. That was in one over. I'm sure a few people spotted that when I was wiring it. 
So we've got three address lines we haven't wired to anything, and we've got the enable line that tells us we want the data on the address bus to be driving the address lines. Okay, so what I propose using here is a 74LS138. So it's one of those 3 to 8 line demultiplexers. So we've got two active low enables and an active high. And we've got three address selection lines on the demultiplexer, which we can take from the high three lines on the address bus. Really shouldn't work on this all powered up. So now our random gunk is coming out on the VGA. Right now, We've got eight decoded address lines on this demultiplexer. So they represent the 64 kilobytes of memory divided into eight even chunks. So by deciding where we're going to plug this wire into the decoder chip, we effectively decide where we're going to map this uh, RAM chip into the memory address space. If I put it here, it would be the top eight kilobytes, but we've got the bootloader there. So I'm going to put it in the eight kilobytes below. So that should be address C000 in hexadecimal. Now we actually only want this line to go low when we've got a memory write operation happening into that region. So we want the mem memory bridge direction line, which is essentially the right line held for the whole cycle. Okay, third line along here is ground. I think we should get a couple of capacitors in as well. We haven't added any to this bottom board yet. Okay, so the memory bridge wires, that header was five pins and I've only got four, but that includes everything we actually are going to want. So that is the direction line. So this line goes low when we're writing to memory. And if I just feed that into one of those active low enables, so now this line is only going to go low during a write to the correct eight kilobytes of memory. And that's cool. Now, this is the right line that is swapped into the write enable on here at the right point. And I think we can just get away with using the load from the memory subsystem. I think technically we need a small delay on it to make sure the address lines have settled, but we are going to be changing it at exactly the same time as the address lines change. And I think we'll get away with that. But we should check the specification sheet for the final memory chip we use when we turn it into a PCB and make sure we're obeying their timing rules. I think this should actually just work. Okay, so let's look at some code. Okay, so here's what I've come up with. This is actually an edited version of the Hello World test program I wrote for testing the bootloader. But I, what I've done is I've just hacked in the address of the VGA memory, set up a loop for eight kilobytes, and just filled it with the total of my counter pair. So we should get an interesting-ish pattern on this. Let's give that a go. I should be able to fire this up with jump zero. Okay, that has not worked. Okay, that's the load line correctly. Okay, I don't think we're selecting the address correctly. That's interesting. Looks like the tight loop that we've got running on here is actually uh, close to an even multiple of the the line frequency. Ah, uh, Mr. Zero off the address. That was a waste of time. Bingo. That's cool. Um, don't think we should get this split in the middle. That should be roughly around the four kilobyte mark. That'd be this bit 
comes from there. Oh, that's the wrong bit of the counter. Awesome. Okay, I've got a bit more coding to do now. Um, let's get a image loaded, give it a proper test. Okay, so this is what I've come up with. I've converted an image into a binary file. Now, what I have calculated is the offset into memory that actually represents the top left pixel. So that's four pixels down and six pixels across. This is because the counters start running at the sync signals and not at the start of the visible region. We'll worry about that later. But what this loop is basically doing is copying 80 bytes from my image buffer and then skipping 128 minus 80 so that it gets to the next line. This could be done a lot more efficiently, but uh, this is going to be more than a sufficient for what we're doing here. Ah, look at that. Okay, now compared to previous iterations of this parrot, we've got three times the horizontal resolution, but we do have one eighth the vertical resolution. But I think everyone should agree that this parrot looks uh, notably better than the previous incarnations. Let's just stick the previous two on the screen. But in terms of this circuit, the CPU is doing nothing now. It's returned back to the monitor. This circuit is completely standalone outputting that image. And so the CPU could be off computing new bits of imagery to draw. So we've really moved this VGA circuit a big step forward today. In fact, actually, in terms of the circuit we've built, with very little addition to this, um, create a, a really quite compelling system because you know, we wouldn't have to change the circuit that much to put a, a lot more RAM in. And we'd only have to replicate this out a bit to go from three bits per color on the DAC to eight bits. So the circuit to go from here to 64480 with 24 bit color wouldn't actually be that much different um, because we've solved the, prob the technical problems to get us there and the rest of it is just um, adding the appropriate extra channels to the circuit. But I don't want to do that. We could get a really nice looking parrot if we did that. But um, obviously this is very much designed for game type work and we're going to be moving on and doing some more interesting uh, technical additions to the circuit in the coming videos. Now, if we go back to the code here and run it again and watch the parrot carefully, we can see what we expected, which was a little bit of corruption on that parrot while we're physically updating the frame buffer. And I said I wasn't actually going to solve that in hardware. I was going to solve that in software. So let's start thinking about that, because if we can get rid of that corruption, then we can start animating the content of the frame buffer using all of the other power of the CPU. And that's going to get a bit more interesting in and of itself. So firstly, we need to be able to read back the status flags again. Now that we pulled high and the load for this we hardwired to the clock, but through that location. This output needs to be the assert line. Okay, so I've got some programming to do now to read this data back and synchronize the update of the frame buffer and get it, see if we can get a decent test going of that. Right, I've connected a physical VJ monitor as I think it's smart to test with that occasionally. I've spent some time coding some animation playback code. If this works, I think you're gonna like it. Ha, take a look at that. Oh, that's awesome. Okay, I'm still seeing a bit of corruption at the top of the screen. That'll be the decompression starting during the vertical blanking, but not quite finishing in time. The way it's just at the top shows the synchronization is working. I could probably resolve that with some more programming, but I've spent far too long on this already. I can see a few places where there's a one pixel error. That's probably a timing issue between the RAM chip and the latch chip that takes the color data. But this is a long enough video as it is. I'll investigate that later.
Okay, I am really pleased with what we managed to achieve in this video today. So every step along the way so far in this VJ build, it's uh, worked the way I was hoping it would. So I'm gradually gaining confidence that uh, everything's going to pan out the way I planned at the start. Very much hope you've been finding this interesting. I have uh, created a Discord server for the channel. I mentioned it in the last CPU video, but I know not everyone is watching those who watches the VGA. So if you're interested in talking about this in a more real-time way, um, the link's down in the description. Okay, hope you found it interesting. See you again soon. Goodbye. Before I go, I just want to mention one other thing. You might have noticed there are some bigger gaps between some of the recent videos. And this isn't anything to do with the project. This is just an awful lot of stuff with my work and personal life has been consuming more time. But uh, this project is still a very high priority to me. I'm not going to give up. I'm not going to let you down. And I'm definitely not going to run around and desert you. Okay, I'm kind of sorry about that, but uh, I had to really. And that was uh, a, a nice stress test of the system we've built so far. And um, on the timing, congratulations to Rick Astley for getting to a billion views. That's uh, numbers we can only dream about on a channel like this. All right. See you soon. Goodbye.